as many as possible uh, during the next one and a half hours. So let's start with Gaj Gajanan. Yes, sir. thank you, sir. So Dr. Mahesh can start with the history. Recording to my... Hello, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. you're audible. Good morning to my all respected teachers and my dear colleagues. Uh, today I'll be presenting a case, uh, Mr. XYZ, who is 55 year old male. He's a graduate shopkeeper by occupation. He hails from the Basayara North 24 Parganas, informant patient himself, and which he is reliable. He presented with chief complaint of pain abdomen on and off for last nine years. History of presenting illness. Patient was apparently all right nine years ago when he developed pain abdomen, which was in epigastric vision, insidious in onset, mild to moderate type, which was uh, boring type. Uh, initially, it used to be uh, in intermittent, which used to be persist from few minutes to hours. However, there was no radiation of this epigastric pain and there was no postural variation of pain. And there were no aggravating factors and it used to relieve with analgesics. So, uh, Dr. Naresh, will you want to ask him some questions at this stage? Naresh? Uh, Samir? Pain is in epigastrium. So, what are the possible organs which can be the source of this infection? I mean, is this pain? Because see, this was epigastric pain, mild to moderate, boring type. Yes, was intermittent. Yes, sir. There was uh, no relationship apparently with meals or posture or associated. So what are the differential of pain with whatever data you have as of now? Uh, sir, uh, epigastric pain, which is the boring type, uh, intermittent, it could be uh, uh, pain arising from the uh, 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 pancreas per se, or uh, pain arising from because of uh, Gall gallstones, polycystitis, and yeah. even uh, gastric ulcers can present. However, uh, uh, if there may be a variation with the meals in uh, pancreatic pain type of pain and uh, even in uh, biliary colic type of pain. I think question Mahesh was not exactly the differential diagnosis. He want, what Samir wanted is that what are the organs which will come to your mind when you talk about epigastric pain? Organs which are present in the epigastrium are uh, stomach, left lobe of liver. Uh, these are the two organs and pancreas. See, why I asked this question was that whenever you get pain in the upper part of abdomen, don't restrict yourself to only abdomen. Some thoracic structures can also present with pain. For example, yes. MI, inferior wall yes. MI can present like that. Inferior wall MI. Uh, even pain can also body. be there. And yes. sometimes rarely... You can have conditions like thoracic radiculopathy. And why I'm saying is you have, should have a broad differential yes, when the upper abdominal pain. So don't restrict yourself to only organs in the abdomen. Yes, you should see yeah. organs which are close to the diaphragm. Okay. Yes, That's if I, I extend that uh, comment, uh, Samir, what I wanted to hear from Mahesh is that the pain may be because of the organs in the epigastrium as well as the organs outside the epigastrium. Absolutely. Which can be either the, either the organs close to the epigastrium or it can be a referred pain from somewhere else. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, can you think of a referred pain uh, here, Mahesh? Mahesh? Sir, again, uh, thoracic, as sir told, radiculopathy can be there in the epigastrium. No, sir is, sir is asking about structures which, which are inside the abdomen, away from the epigastrium, and pain being interpreted or referred to epigastrium. So you know that appendicular pain may not always be starting the right way of fossa. Yes, sir. Usually it will be periumbilical. Uh, sometimes it can be epigastrium can also be there, but usually it will be periumbilical initially to begin with. So what Samir and me, are, we are trying to say, Mahesh, is that when you have a pain at a particular area, the first thing we should come in our mind is what are the organs in that area? Number two, what are the organs close to that area? And number three, can this be a referred pain? Second question was that you, you have written that there are no aggravating factors. 
in a person who present with epigastric pain, which are the relevant aggravating factors you'll ask for in history? Uh, sir, usually with uh, meals, uh, uh, like in gastric ulcer, there can be having increased pain with the aggravated on taking meals, sir, gastric ulcer. And the uh, following taking uh, uh, meals, pancreatic type of pain can be aggravated. Uh, and following taking fatty meals, then uh, 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 biliary colic pain can be aggravated, sir. One of the one of the factors you have such a significant pain is any relationship with movement. Yes. Yeah. See, if you compare visceral parietal, what sir asked, for example, acute appendicitis. Yes. You need to look at any there was any relationship with movement. Was the pain becoming worse with movement, or it was being relieved, or it was not affected by the movement? Food was important because the location of pain is epigastrium. You need to ask for relationship with food, but posture change is also one of the things you should need to look at. The question that I want to ask you is that this patient has been having pain for nine years, yes. all right? And yes. uh, perhaps it's taken him more than required time to get a diagnosis. So in your experience of your reading, what are the common causes of pain that go on for so long and may sometimes go unrecognized? But, uh, one, it can be functional type of pain or it could be organic type of pain. Uh, in case there are no alarming signs, then functional type of pain like uh, epigastric pain syndrome or in uh, IBS can be a possibility. However, persisting for uh, nine years without consulting doctor or without having any alarming symptoms, uh, I first keep as functional. Then, however, it is rare in males compared to females, uh, lesser common in males compared to females. In uh, Chronic in uh, organic type of pain, it could be chronic pancreatitis can be there, or uh, any uh, slow growing mal uh, malignancies possibility are however rare, but it can give a longer prob uh, probability and uh, vascular like uh, any mesenteric ischemia. Though the rare diagnosis, they can uh, run for longer durations. Tell me one cancer which will uh, one malignancy which will manifest for nine years. You said rarely it can happen. Is there any tumor you can think about which can have persist for nine years? Uh, sir, uh, what I meant to say, like uh, initially, like chronic pancreatitis uh, going into the malignancy at the later phases, right at that no, no. time. Primarily yeah. starting off as a tumor Yeah, is what Dr. Mayesh is asking you. Uh, sir, uh, but to have for a longer duration is very unlikely sir, uh, because by the time patient will be diagnosed, uh, they won't be staying present. No, you can have neuroendocrine tumors, which can be extremely indolent and fun, can go on for a long period of time. See, there are other conditions that you must keep in. I mean, you've rightly thought sure. about chronic pancreatitis. Uh, but remember, most of your functional dyspepsia or irritable bowel have to have some bowel disturbance or relationship to food and so on. So that will come much less lower down the list. But a lot of times that you have patients with bands or an abdominal cocoon or things like that may just go unrecognized unless you really evaluate them with whatever imaging and so on. Yes. I think you can what go the, What will be the manifestation of superior mesenteric artery syndrome? Usually they will have postprandial uh, uh, pain will be there, a uh, mild pain for chronic uh, uh, chronic mesenteric ischemia, sir. Usually in acute, uh, they can have a sudden onset of uh, pain will be there following meals mm -hmm. and they may even present with GI bleeding. No, don't confuse mesenteric ischemia with SMA syndrome. Yeah. SMA syndrome SMA is syndrome. more of a mechanical problem yes, because of the angle between the sir, aorta and the super mesenteric artery. Uh, they may present with mainly uh, duodenal obstruction uh, features can be there, sir. Uh, uh, postprandial vomiting after one to two hours, usually they will be having pain, pain and vomiting. Another important symptom in SMS syndrome is weight loss. Yes, if a long history, you will always have significant weight loss along with postprandial fullness and vomiting. Weight loss is a very prominent symptom yes. with long history. In this patient, apparently there was no weight loss as per yes. what no, sir, there was no. Okay, so as Naresh asked, we, we should continue the next slide. Is that okay, Naresh? Yeah, yeah, I think we should.
this uh, that uh, the pain was not associated with any history of vomiting obstipation or abdominal distension there was no history of any fever and jaundice there was no history of abdominal trauma there was no history of any regular drug intake like ansets there was no history of any altered bowel habits gi bleed joint pains or skin rashes and there was no history of any awareness of uh, abdominal lump there was no history of any palpitation sweating giddiness or diabetes mellitus you said uh, regular drug intake and said ansets is there anything else that may uh, be very relevant uh, mahesh uh especially uh, yeah. sir uh, 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 sir uh, alternate uh, medicine sir what else camps. very good camps. camps very good what else uh, see uh, in your day to day practice if you find a 9 years old history of pain abdomen there is something which is patients take regularly sometimes uh, on over the counter medicines what about ppis Yes, PPS. They over the counter. They can take PPA. Okay. What about opiates? Can he be taking opiates, which can be giving him problems? Uh, sir, uh, narcotic uh, uh, narcotic bowel syndrome can be one of the possibility uh, if patient is on long run of taking uh, opiates or not. So specifically, those are the questions that you would want to ask. Yes, sir. I think just go on. Uh, one. Uh, he consulted a, a local doctor and was started on some medication for the pain and pain was subsided uh, in the how uh, in la, up to till 2019 patient had similar episodes of pain abdomen which was around one to two episodes per year and he used to uh, take the medication and used to subside in 2019 along with uh, similar type of pain abdomen patient noticed just one of, minute mahesh Yes. you again said episodic pain now you are bringing on this concept that the pain was largely episodic so if you have a chap who's got male patient with episodic pain uh, fairly significant uh, what can it be that you don't want to miss um, uh, male patient with episodic type of pain sir You said complementary therapy. That means possibly lead. Uh, yes, sir. Said would be uh, narcotic bowel. Narcotic. What bowel. else? Uh, fairly simple things. Common sir, things. Por that is gastroenterologists we often miss. Oh, porphyria can be there okay. if there is a family history of uh, okay. pain okay. is there, and uh, in children's abdominal migraine okay. can be there. Tell me one thing. Like hernia. See, yes, very sir. commonly. Yes, hernias are often missed because as gastroenterologists we somehow are not trained to recognize them early and remember that they can just be a source of recurrent pain in episodic right so this right. is something you must keep in mind the others are nerve entrapment syndromes yes those are again something that you should be aware of think okay? sometimes you have lipomas in the abdominal wall that are sort of painful yes. so very Uh, less known or less familiar conditions you need to keep in mind when you're dealing with someone who's got a long history. And another thing was that whenever you take history in abdominal pain, you should always ask for any intervention done. That is abdominal surgery or any endoscopy yes. done. Yes. That important. Any any site of location of pain in abdomen, abdominal surgery history is very relevant. And number two, you had written that no history of nutritional deficiency. Which are the common nutrients you asked for, which manifest clinically? Uh, in this, like a patient had along with pain, he had passed uh, greasy stools. So usually, yeah. uh, uh, fat soluble vitamin deficiencies, uh, like vitamin uh, for vitamin E deficiency, night blindness or xerostomia, uh, I have asked. And uh, for uh, vitamin D, any bony pains or generalized fatigue, I have asked. Uh, vitamin E, uh, they may have neuropathic. Pain of that vitamin K, yes, uh, ecchymosis, uh, I mean to say bleeding yeah. below under the skin, manifestations I asked. Yeah, in vitamin D deficiency, you can also have spasms. Yes, tetanus, tetanus, spasms. So yes. spasm and tetanus, these are the manifestation. Plus, you can always ask for peripheral neuropathy and ataxia. Yes, 
Sometimes what happens is there is some problem in the gate which gives you an idea that it can be a potential vitamin E deficiency. How often do you see vitamin E deficiency uh, in patients? How many have you seen? And why is it rare? I haven't seen any. In, and why in is it rare? Period. You're right. You don't see it often, but why is it rare? Uh, sir, most of the food uh, uh, contains vitamin E and T. No. That's not the reason. The reason is that it is stored in the fat cells. So we have a lot of stores of vitamin E. So though the diet may, you may not be absorbing enough vitamin E, the enough stores to keep you going for a very long time. Unlike children who manifest earlier with vitamin E deficiency. All right, so that's why we don't see. But you also said intolerance to wheat products. What are the implications of that, uh, Mahesh? Uh, sir, actually, I wanted to ask for the any malabsorption uh, disease uh, in, I mean to say, celiac disease, particularly I wanted to rule out, uh, since they can have, but usually they will present with uh, a chronic diarrhea, water type of diarrhea, sometimes they may have a malabsorption symptoms also. So how many patients with celiac tell you that I can't tolerate wheat? See, that's not often that you see, it's only when you really test, because most wheat on intolerance may be non-celiac, mm -hmm or because yes, of the high lactose. fiber, uh, you know, content. So celiac is not the common thing when you say wheat intolerance. Go ahead. Yeah, my, uh, Mahesh, one, Mahesh one. I'm not clear from your history as to what is the duration of each episode. Uh, till now, so, whatever you have said, I didn't hear that. Uh, sir, each episode usually it used to last for one to two days as per the patient. And uh, like sometimes it used to last for a, a few minutes to hours. Then with medication, they used to reduce. And per year, he had one to two episodes, sir, till 2019. The only thing which I'm not matching is you're calling this pain a boring pain. And then you are saying there's a pain which comes and lasts for a few minutes. I think uh, it actually doesn't go one to one. I mean, usually a pain lasting for a few minutes uh, will not be a boring type of pain. Uh, sir, initially it's to like last four minutes, then like within by the uh, uh, to start with it used to be initially last four minutes, then with the by the day end he used to tell that it used to last for longer duration for hours. He used to tell. I personally don't like the word boring pain. Pain uh, cannot be Lally. boring for him. Yeah. It was so what, like, what do you mean by boring pain? I mean, don't want to talk. It can to be boring to the doctor, but cannot be boring to the patient. Boring is basically something that's deep seated and going down inside. So that's what you mean by boring, right? It's, yes, so I agree with my age that sometimes we use it inappropriately and can convey wrong. Uh... Okay, let's move on. Uh, he visited uh, his family doctor and was advised blood test and ultrasound. And he was told to have some abdominal calculi for which he was referred to a gastroenterologist. He consulted gastroenterologist at an outside hospital where he was hospitalized and evaluated. He underwent imaging and some endoscopic procedure. He was started on oral medication with which his symptoms had subsided during that episode. So what is your uh, yeah. sorry, 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 sorry. diagnosis at this stage with, with all this information that you have? Uh, sir, a 55-year-old male presented with a chronic abdominal uh, don't, don't, don't bring it back. Don't No need to think when you're in the exam. Just be brief. What's your diagnosis? If you have one diagnosis, two, three, whatever, just tell uh, us. Sir, what uh, one diagnosis, uh, pain up down with uh, uh, greasy stool. I want to put the first diagnosis as uh, chronic uh, pancreatitis with exocrine insufficiency. Okay. Uh, then uh, second, uh, I want to put as uh, chronic pain up down with uh, 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 abdominal tuberculosis, however, the uh, malabsorption syndrome uh, symptoms are not so common. But in being in India uh, for having uh, long duration now, of pain. You, you have chronic pain, you have some bowel disturbance, and you have and some pain. abdominal calculi. I mean, those are the three things that you have. Yeah. So based on that, what is your, what can you sort of... Uh, so while we are at tuberculosis, how will you explain without seeing any images, what are the possibility of these calculi in a tuberculosis patient? So your first possibility is obvious. Yes, sir. Calculi are very unlikely in them. So can there be, these calculi can be calcification? Can there be some calcification, calcification in your... the lymph nodes uh, can be the possibility. Sir. Anything uh, else? Lymph nodes. Any other 
Shadow. Any other way of calcification or op opacity which can happen in tuberculosis? Though your history, though your history doesn't go very well with intestinal obstruction. Yes. What about enteroliths? Yes, sir. Enteroliths can be the possibilities. Yeah. I mean, this the history doesn't go with obstruction. I agree. But enteroliths. Yes, what about something like hypercalcemia with some kind of calcification, renal stones? Is that a possibility? Possibility is there, sir. Uh, like again, hypercalcemia can be one of the. Uh, uh, cause for chronic pancreatitis, which may have uh, like uh, uh, calculi in the renal calculi, uh, pancreatic calculi can be there. Possibility if patient is having calcium level of more than 12, one of the criteria for that. Very good. So it just tell me what <laughs> clinical situations do you ever entertain a diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis? Because this guy, he's gone, gone around for nine years before getting a diagnosis. We should have done him a favor by diagnosing it at least eight years earlier. So when would you suspect chronic pancreatitis? Uh, so a patient who is having a chronic uh, visceral type of pain, okay. uh, which is aggravated with meals, and uh, if there is any risk factors or habits like smoking, alcohol. Uh, not necessary, not necessary. Not you don't necessary. have to put any clause to that. Just yes. anyone with chronic abdominal pain, you would keep that as a possibility. What else? Uh, with uh, any uh, recent onset of uh, diabetes or uh, okay Di uh, diabetes any okay what what subgroup of diabetes diabetes is so common yes, so what uh, subgroup of diabetes do you suspect chronic pancreatitis so the, uh, patient who is having brittle type of diabetes I mean, uh, they, uh, they are very uh, uh, the erratic reading of the sugar levels, even with treatment, uh, there are high chances of going them into hypoglycemia chances are there. What else? No. Uh, what else? Is, uh, uh, so rather than diabetes, you mean? So, weight um, loss, young people, young yes, diabetics, sir. diabetics with weight loss, patients who come to you with uh, Diarrhea, whatever, or steatoria, right? Patients who come to you with duodenal obstruction, biliary obstruction, patients with undiagnosed ascites, undiagnosed effusions. See, there's a big spectrum. So you all in all of them, you need to suspect chronic pancreatitis. Yes. So if you have a very narrow thing, you'll miss a lot of these patients. So I have one question, uh, Mahesh, um, yes, uh, and Dr. Jayanti asked a question just now. One is that how can somebody miss a diagnosis of chronic pancreatitis for nine years? What is the explanation in this case, number one? Uh, and number two, let me complete. Number two, uh, if you do not have the history of calculus and if you're thinking of pancreatic origin, will you call it a recurrent acute pancreatitis or will you call it a chronic pancreatitis? Uh, okay, sir. So uh, the first part, uh, uh, I, I entered detail in the patient. Actually, initially, he was uh, consulted to a local officer and they had not advised for any imaging or blood test initially. Because it used to occur uh, for only like one to two episodes per year. So over the counter also, he used to take medication. Not every time he had consulted the doctor, sir. In 2019, he had uh, 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 like persistent pain and severe, uh, the quality of uh, intensity of pain was increased. So during that time, when he consulted his uh, family physician, then they uh, are told to undergo the imaging and detailed blood investigation. Before that, he was not investigated and he was not told to get an investigation. Mahesh, Mahesh, if uh, we'll be coming to investigations, but I want to ask because based on this slide, if you would have come the first time to you with these complaints, which single investigator you would have asked for as a first step towards clinching the diagnosis? I mean, I'm asking you because somebody investigated him, but if you would have come to you for the first time with these complaints, which would have been your investigation of choice? You don't have to and we'll discuss the investigation later, but at least you can the investigation with the profile which this patient had. Sir, uh, I would uh, go for CT scan. Okay, we'll discuss it when the investigations come. Okay. What about acute, right. recurrent, acute recurrent pancreatitis versus chronic pancreatitis? What will be a syndromic diagnosis? Uh, sir, uh, recurrent acute pancreatitis, uh, it can be a spectrum of chronic pancreatitis, sir. Initially, Patient, uh, however, it was very difficult to differentiate based on just history, um, because again in chronic pancreatitis there can be two types of uh, uh, type A, type, type B type of pain can be there. 
in recurrent acute pancreatitis patient can have uh, uh, acute episodes and uh, in between patient can, uh, will be pain free uh, whenever there is a uh, however in chronic pancreatitis there can be a flares however the intensity of pain can be uh, less as compared to the recurrent acute so mahesh i'll stop you here i think your understanding is not correct recurrent acute pancreatitis you must you must have acute pancreatitis yes and we know the definition of acute pancreatitis two out of three yes sir Atlantic. pain evidence pain, of imaging. based enzymes and imaging imaging sir. so if you don't have two out of those three you can't call it acute so how does it become recurrent acute it can't so okay. it will straight away go to chronic pancreatitis if at all you have to consider it so i think this okay. is a very important point mahesh which you need to understand that uh, rap is acute pancreatitis so there has to be features of acute pancreatitis there are two uh, comments uh, naresh one is ajit ajit harakan asking does the pain match pancreatic origin yes you want to so, take it up mahesh yes sir uh, so it was uh, again a uh, visceral type of pain because in this it was located in the central uh, it was not well localized and it was more of boring or dull aching type of pain was there and uh, uh, however uh, the typical feature like uh, aggravated with meals it may not be found in 30 to 40% in chronic pancreatitis yeah. so, so that right, brings to another answer, question one minute mahesh i make a yes sure the simple answer is only 40% of patients who have pain are fairly typical what is described in undergraduate textbooks so you can have a big spectrum of pain it can be mild severe and unfortunately it does not correlate with what you are seeing on imaging or what is the extent of disease in the pancreas yes hello so uh, there was another question i think about possibility of polylithiasis should we entertain the diagnosis of polylithiasis prashant asked prashant asked that question sir uh, chronic calculus polycystitis uh, can be a possibility but however for uh, diagnosed having for 9 years very unlikely but one of the differentials can be kept for chronic abdominal pain yes but why how will you explain significant steatorrhea with chronic calculus sir, no sir uh, Sir, if there so, is a basic, so basically, what you need to look at is bowel and pancreas. Pancreas, both. So these are two organs. Other rare causes like somatostenoma is not relevant in this case, where there is suppression of pancreatic enzymes. So basically, we have to look at bowel, where diffuse bowel disease can lead to steatorrhea, or any history of bowel or pancreatic surgery can lead to this, or there is disease which is involved extensively pancreas. So what I asked was with this history. is it possible that you can have acute calculus polycystitis or chronic calculus polycystitis so your answer should be no with significant steatorrhea long history and pain which can go either way but steatorrhea won't be explained by chronic calculus polycystitis yes. now uh, this time he presented to us with upper pain abdomen on and off since 15 days however uh, initially it was mild then it uh, started persisting uh, a persistent type of pain was there for last 7 days it, this time pain was insidious in onset again it was in epigastric region initially it was mild then it was moderate intensity in for last 7 days so boring aching type of pain was there it uh, this time it was radiating to the back and uh, pain was aggravated with meals and it was relieved with analgesics with this complaint uh, he had visited nearby hospital uh, for which he underwent some imaging and then uh, he was brought to us sir by after imaging uh, there and along with this pain abdomen with greasy stool this time he had uh, unquantified weight loss in last 7 to 8 months it was associated with a uh, decreased appetite in the form of a uh, quantity of uh, food which was consumed earlier before uh, 78 months it's gradually decreasing and there was no history of any vomiting altered to loose stools or constipation or bleeding manifestation there is no history of any fever jaundice or uh, contact with tuberculosis patient there is no history of awareness of any lump there was no history of any nutritional deficiencies like colitis angular stomatitis night blindness bony pain there is no history of any skin discoloration or itch marks just a minute just to make a point here you said he had weight loss 
uh, you said unquantified, you must be able to make out some kind of thing. You can't say unquantified and get away with it. Uh, so, and you said uh, decreased appetite. So you should also tell us how much is he eating compared to earlier? Okay. okay. The second question is, can you get weight loss with increased appetite? Yes, sir. Possibilities are there. Uh, what? What are the possibilities? Uh, like in hyperthyroidism, uh, patient can have and in diabetes mellitus. Very good. Excellent. They can have diabetes mellitus Excellent. and hyperthyroidism. But you must tell us how much weight loss, some kind of subjective thing uh, sir, or uh, appetite. What is his in intake? How much has it decreased? You must be able to tell us. That. Intake, well, what you told was like uh, uh, up to 10 to 25 percent. It has decreased from earlier, in uh, which was mainly noticed in last one month, sir. In the, and uh, in uh, weight loss, he told like approximately 20% of initial weight loss he has lost. No one tells you 20%. Uh, he'll tell you in a few kgs or he'll tell is, you, you know, my clothes have become loose or some kind of thing like that. No one, no one tells you 20%. So. Regarding, the, I asked, regarding the loosening of clothes, he is telling uh, like mildly after a repeated asking, mild loosening he has told. However, significant losing of clothes he has not mentioned. Sir. Okay, fair enough. I think Dr. Jayanti made an interesting uh, observation. She's asking you, what is the change in the pattern of pain? I think I think that's a very important uh, thing. I, I think maybe you should address that and why is it important? Well, sir, initially, patient uh, uh, was, uh, the pain was not aggravated with meals. However, uh, now it has aggravated with meals and it started radiating to the back also which was not there in the earlier episodes for last eight years, eight to nine years. Um, Mahesh, everybody is, seems to be asking this question and Dr. Jayanti in particular, that whether we can attribute everything happening for the last nine years to pectronic pancreatitis, or do you think this was a, some other pain, maybe epigastric pain syndrome, and uh, superated on that, the patient developed chronic pancreatitis subsequently, and we are trying to stitch everything to chronic pancreatitis. Possibility is there, sir, uh, because... Uh, earlier features are not uh, very typical or suggestive of, but uh, however, in uh, past history, I have even uh, clue uh, which will tell us that it may be because of chronic pancreatitis. Because in 2015, sir, uh, he was diagnosed to have uh, diabetes mellitus and he was started on taking medications for that. All Symptoms right. were started in 2012. However, in 2015, he uh, was diagnosed to have diabetes. That is there. Uh, All right, let's move on. Uh, sir, uh, uh, after coming to our hospital uh, uh, with the APO complaints, uh, he received oral, subcutaneous, and IV medications, and he was evaluated by blood investigation and imaging. He underwent endoscopic procedure after admission, and at present, his pain has subsided and he is passing normal stools. So, um, Gajanan, what next? Yes. So we have a first poll question uh, for the audience. So this is a quite straightforward question. Which of the following is most likely to cause pain in the left iliac fossa? Out of these following options, A is appendicitis, B is cecal growth, C is acute pancreatitis, and D is a sigmoid colon mass. This is to find out if they are asleep or? <laughs> the first, uh, this is a starter. Okay. okay, so we have the results here. The results of 76% have marked the correct answer. That is the sigmoid colon mass. 20% still think that it can be appendicitis. And 4% say it's acute pancreatitis. So I'll just end the poll. So Mahesh, uh, how do you explain somebody thinking left iliac fossa pain being because of the appendicitis? Uh, again, uh, uh, in like the mechanism for uh, miseral pain and uh, parietal pain, sir. The visceral pain initially, patient can have a, a, a pain at, because of dull aching pain. Usually, it will be in central or it can be in other side. However, uh, and it is not very well localized. You, after the uh, involvement of the peritoneum, uh, then the pain will be localized to the right iliac fossa. Uh, that is because of uh, somatic parietal type of pain. So I think uh, other point is there may be as though it's 20% saying appendicitis is a little high, but then we have to also think situs inverses is always a small but different possibility. 
there's what is wrong? There's a mirror image thing of pain. Sometimes we've seen this in gallbladder. We have left-sided pain with gallbladder disease. Not common, should not be sort of a considered very strongly, but sometimes you have this. But in appendicitis, I, I, I must accept that maybe situs inverse is maybe the only explanation. So what is the Robson sign? Well, again, it is seen in uh, appendicitis, sir. Uh, what is it? Uh, on a rising uh, leg, there can be pain in the epigastrium. Oh, no, exactly. No. You must? No, no. no. Uh, Something to do with the psoas muscle? Yes, sir. Uh, because of inflammation. So it's pressure in the left iliac fossa which elicits pain. And that's called Robson sign. Okay, let's move on. So in the past history, a uh, patient had uh, bone tuberculosis uh, in the right hip joint. Uh, in, uh, it was in 1978. He underwent uh, surgery uh, in the form. He told that uh, pus was drained and then sent for uh, investigation. Then it turned to be tuberculosis. Then uh, he took ATT for two to three years. Following that, he was told to have uh, cure. Uh, he was dying. He's known a case of hypertension since 2010. And he was diagnosed to have diabetes mellitus since 2015, sir. And there was no history of any uh, surgeries, abdominal or other surgeries, abdominal surgeries in the past. Coming to the personal history, uh, diet was mixed. Uh, calorie uh, intake, he is taking 980 kilocalories per day, protein intake of uh, 30 gram per day. Uh, 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 for his weight, sir, uh, where I had calculated in further, uh, it was a deficient, he was deficient of 490 kilocalories with uh, 20 gram of proteins. However, uh, his appetite is uh, uh, decreased. A ball what and is blood the nature of removed. his job? Sir, his his job intake, uh, uh, telling sir, us what does he do? Uh, he's a shopkeeper, sir. Actually, uh, he's a uh, does a, mainly he has a uh, desk job. Uh, depending on the stress factors, uh, normally the uh, kilocalories for a normal BMI patient, uh, 20 to 25 kilocalories per day is required. However, for mild uh, stress, so or, sedentary, sedentary thing. So okay, okay, go ahead. Because you need to factor that in when you yes, calculate the calories. Yes, sir. Uh, appetite was decreased, uh, bladder and bowel were regular, sleep was normal, uh, alcohol intake, uh, he used to consume whiskey 90 uh, ml uh, uh, once in two months for five years. However, since the diagnosis of hypertension, he had a strict abstinence uh, since then. Uh, he used to smoke cigarettes uh, until the current admissions, 8 to 12 cigarettes per day for the last 20 years. Uh, it was around uh, 10 pack years. And used to tobacco, uh, choose tobacco in the form of kaini, uh, one pack per day for last 20 years. Do you think this is significant? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, smoking uh, alcohol, uh, it is not significant amount is not there. However, uh, smoking uh, is a significant amount, sir. And tobacco chewing, mainly smoking. What is the amount of smoking that is correlated with chronic pancreatitis? Uh, is there something or there is no such data? Uh, sir, there is a uh, li linear correlation. However, uh, I don't know exact pack years, like how much, but there is a linear correlation you know, with the amount and the duration of the smoking with the one of the cause for uh, pancreatitis. Now, usually they say about 35 pack years or 20 or 25 cigarettes and more per day. So by think, but yes, you would still consider it. Why would you say even smaller amounts may be um, important? or in causative uh, or in causation of chronic pancreatitis? How do you reconcile to this? Uh, so in this patient, sir. Okay, in any patient, he doesn't quite reach that mark that is stated in literature, yet it may be important. And it, how, may be, how... uh, it may be uh, like along with the other factors like uh, environmental genetic factors, uh, smoking can be one of the contributing on that, which may lead to the development of chronic pancreatitis. There may be an associated Co-factor like a genetic factor. Very good. Excellent. Very good. Mahesh, Mahesh, one more thing. See, the most important thing in this slide is that he chewed tobacco also. Yes, sir. One cigarette contains around one gram of nicotine. So it's not necessary that it's only smoking because candy is a local problem. 
but still you have to consider the amount of nicotine which goes through khani to add to whatever nicotine is going through smoking so nicotine intake may become significant if we add both the things yes um yes sir can treatment is sir uh, he used to take uh, tell me certain 40 mg once daily for uh, hypertension and for diabetes he is he was on oral anti diabetic drugs and insulin and he underwent endoscopic procedure twice once in 2019 and in the current admissions are you one more are you one more about what drugs sorry uh, sorry sir Price, you carry on carry on sir carry on what are the anti diabetic drugs you just mentioned passing isn't that important as what drugs yes sir uh, sir he told like uh, uh, exactly doesn't remember the name but however he is telling that he used to take post prandially uh, initially when it was started he used to take pre prandially also before food uh, now he is telling the post prandially twice daily he was taking uh, uh, with uh, insulin sir uh, which is uh, like uh, thrice daily he is taking uh, so, uh, what drugs insulin. what drugs and what is it doing to his diabetes is it under control is he is he hypoing so those are the three things that i want to know okay uh, sir uh, with this uh, as per the patient told that his uh, like sugar were not very well controlled however he was in a regular follow up uh, only once he told a hypoglycemic episode he had from the diagnosis uh, and he has a regular uh, because he was on a regular check even in home he used to have uh, self control monitoring of the glucose and he was uh, aware of how to prevent of hypoglycemia or any symptoms if he develops so he was taking care of that okay well, so what hba1c level would you be happy with in this patient uh, sir uh, what what is your target and less, less than 7 seven. seven you said yes sir seven Seven system. No, it should be should be seven plus, especially in these patients. Because one thing you remember, HbA1c doesn't tell you about his hypo. No, sir. Right. So no, it sir. is HbA1c may not be the best target for him. You may actually need to monitor his sugars much more, not just HbA1c. Right, and especially since you say he is taking a meal time insulin, which means it's not a bolus. No, He's taking no. short acting insulin. Short acting insulin. So. you have to be even more careful about monitoring and don't depend on a hpvc as your target okay this is called time in range now no you know the concept of time in range yes sir or monitoring yeah yes so which anti diabetic drug do you don't want him to be taking and that's uh, what you would want to know in the history sir uh, 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 glp1 and uh, uh, the dp4 sir because they are known to uh, it has found that up to 2 to 3% they can cause pancreatic cancer gliptins gliptins okay mahesh just two questions how do you say that alcohol intake is significant in the context of chronic pancreatitis number one number two is onset or detection of diabetes was 4 to 5 years after his first episode of pain if you want to explain by pancreatic disease that is mainly chronic pancreatitis or recurrent acute pancreatitis can you explain it Uh, yes, sir. Uh, sir, first uh, regarding the first question, alcohol. However, uh, there was no uh, exact uh, the quantity and duration. But in one study, it was only at least up to uh, two to three standard drink per day for up to five to five years. Uh, earliest can cause, but however, up to ten years, uh, two to three standard drinks may cause pancreatitis. They are told, but exact uh, quantification of uh, or causation of the disease has not been uh, well documented, sir. And uh, regarding sir, <coughs> regarding onset of sir, uh, regarding onset, uh, the natural history of chronic pancreatitis, uh, they will have having symptoms. Then first they will have exocrine insufficiency. Then patient will develop uh, endocrine insufficiency. However, in uh, uh, idiopathic type of uh, chronic uh, idiopathic type, uh, mainly late onset. They can have early uh, endocrine, then followed by exocrine. Uh, possibility is there sir see roughly roughly you should remember five drinks per day for five years four drinks per day for six years that is what most of the studies take into account number two depends the pain and onset of diabetes will depend upon how patient perceives pain so if patient has got high pain threshold or if the degree of inflammation is low then the gap between onset of pain and diabetes will not necessarily be 10 to 15 years 
You understand that? So it, yes. it varies. The morphology and functional derangement, they don't go one-to-one. One-to-one, one. yes. There's a variation in the spectrum of the disease. So you can't say that if diabetes were detected four years after the onset of pain, it can't be explained. Okay? Possible. And he was investigated nine years down the line. The disease may have been for a long period of time. Good. What was the age of the patient? Dr. Jayanti wants to know what is the age of the patient? Sir, right now, 55 years. All right. The pain started nine years back. Yes, sir. Nine years. Okay. All right. Carry on. Uh, uh, family is sir. Uh, he's, married, uh, he's having a non consanguineous marriage. Uh, he's having four brothers and three sisters. Uh, none of them had any similar uh, uh, history in the family or no history of any malignancy in the family. Uh, they are having one uh, a child who is male around 20 years who is healthy. Uh, coming to the summary, a uh, 55 year old male with known case of uh, hypertension presented with chronic episodic pain abdomen associated with greasy stool and diabetes mellitus with uh, recent on onset of unquantified weight loss without any history of jaundice, fever, or GI bleed. And he underwent endoscopic procedure twice in the once in past and in the current admission with significant history of smoking and there was a past history of extrapulmonary tuberculosis in the form of bone tuberculosis which was treated. see uh, uh, i think we already discussed the questions which will which could have been asked at this stage but one point which was very important and dr prashant raised this that you said that as soon as the endoscopic procedure was done pain disappeared and the stool became normal it looks like a, a good end of a bollywood movie so does the does the endoscopic procedure will it cause immediate improvement of his cheatoria? Uh, no, How sir, do you explain uh, that? You did mention that the stool became normal and the pain disappeared. Sir, actually in uh, 2019 when he developed a uh, uh, greasy stool uh, during the episode also he underwent one episode of uh, endoscopic procedure. Then he was started. Uh, a simple question is asking you: Does endotherapy improve cheatoria? Yes, no. Yes. If so, why? Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, it can improve if there is any obstructive uh, uh, like a pancreatic calculi, intraductal calculi. If it is uh, released, then the uh, uh, the pancreatic juices can flow uh, into the duodenum. Then the okay. pancreatic lipase, which was uh, short or whatever it is, their reserve is there. If it has been released, then uh, chances of uh, resolving of steatoria can be there. But in chronic pancreatitis, most of the when the patient develop uh, steatoria because of just parenchymal involvement. The reserve will be more, more than 90 percent will be lost. In them, the endoscopic therapy may not help in relieving of steatoria. If just because of uh, any uh, ductal uh, uh, blockage is there, if it is relieved, if the patient still having a good pancreatic reserve, then the steatoria can be relieved. That could be the theoretical experience. So, if I ask you, majority will the steatoria disappear, or will majority the steatoria will not disappear? What will, will be not disappear, will not disappear with the uh, endoscopic procedures. And even if it disappears, it will not be as no. instantaneous as a pain relief would be. Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I think uh, to an extent, see, it all depends on what your cause of chronic pancreatitis. Is it a ductocentric disease? Is it essentially a parenchymal disease? And that is what will decide. So I don't think there's a clear yes or no. And most of these patients would be on PERT as well. Okay, so that may be an additional factor that is making thing. I don't think there's a clear yes or no. You can expect maybe if there is a improvement in steatoria, bonus, take it. Yes. Um, I think we are a little beyond midway, uh, Naresh. So we move. Uh, so there are some uh, take-home messages. Um, Gajanan, you had? Uh, yes, at this point. yes, yes. After uh, this poll question, sir. So uh, there's another second poll question for all the audience. Which is the most common etiology of chronic pancreatitis in India? The options are A, idiopathic, B, alcohol, C, autoimmune, and D, genetic. Manish, please run the poll. Manish? Yes, so okay. the poll has started. Okay, so. So most of the people, majority believe it's alcohol. 
uh, followed very closely by idiopath and 2% believe that uh, it's genetic yes so uh, this is the reason why we asked this question we have a large series from india which was a multi center trial by balakrishnan v et al it's published in journal of pancreas 2008 where they had taken 1086 uh, patients and in which idiopathic pancreatitis was seen in 60% uh, of them whereas alcohol was 38.7 However, alcohol may be the most common cause in Western populations. I think it will all depend on which geographical area you are focusing on. Yes, Since yes. this was just a kind of a postal kind of survey or just a thing, I don't think these are absolute things. Maybe if you sit in, say, Punjab, where alcoholism perhaps is much more, maybe they have more. You don't know. Like you have in the West, where alcoholism is more than idiopathic. so i think we can say that the two important causes of pancreatic in india are idiopathic and alcoholic i think that may be a better way to look at the data yeah well, one point i wanted to make here was that what sir said is absolutely right if you look at china 80% are idiopathic india 60% west 30% what you need to look at which geographical area are looking at and more one of studies are coming which are showing that out of these idiopathic so called idiopathic 40 to 50% have some kind of genetic mutation and especially people who present in a early age that is less than 35 years of age so this idiopathic group is going to shrink now the and and the oh, other thing sorry. is that dr jayant just mentioned that where is tropical pancreatitis so tropical pancreatitis included in the idiopathic group yes <coughs> sir it was initially uh, uh, in idiopathic only it was included sir however early now, onset early uh, onset idiopathic yes, is your so now they are including topical in uh, idiopathic uh, early onset idiopathic so i'll just run through uh, five six uh, short slides which will include pain abdomen and steatorrhea so as we have discussed the pain abdomen approach should basically start with the onset of the pain whether it is visceral or parietal is very important in differentiation then we uh, see the location from the location we visualize which organ it might be originating from and accordingly we see the character of the pain whether it is radiating or not radiating and the aggravating and relieving factors now the uh, location is important because as we know that the different organs situated in the epigastrium the right upper quadrant will point towards the pain for example in the epigastrium it would be more likely to originate from the stomach the biliary tract or the pancreas whereas the right upper quadrant pain can be more likely to originate from the biliary tract liver or the basal pleura similarly for the right iliac fossa and the left iliac fossa and for the left upper quadrant it is rarely directly related to the anatomical structure but occasionally it can be due to the stomach or the uh, spleen so uh, these are the characteristic uh, features of some common uh, causes of pain abdomen as we all know appendicitis usually starts uh, with a visceral type of pain but as it uh, involves the uh, peritoneum it will be more localized to the right iliac fossa and it will be a diffuse uh, pain abdomen which will have a aching type of characteristic similarly for cholecystitis it will be acute onset in the mid epigastric uh, region and uh, or in the right upper quadrant which will be localized and constricting type of pain similarly for pancreatitis diverticulitis the onset location characteristics are important so one must not miss this and this is a very basic table given in schlesinger which we should uh, remember now the most important uh, that we said that in initially when we dis, uh, differentiate between visceral and parietal type of pain abdomen the character of visceral pain abdomen is usually dull cramping burning gnawing type of pain and it is poorly localized whereas parietal can be sharp and it is well localized in visceral pain abdomen the onset is more gradual it is located in the midline and the movement may reduce the pain the patient is usually restless the common examples of biliary or renal colic whereas in parietal pain abdomen the pain is usually lateralized sudden onset and here the patient is usually still in the bed you can see that even a slight movement will aggravate his pain the common example is the acute uh, late part of the acute appendicitis so these are the pointers and uh, which can help on clinically to differentiate between visceral and parietal similarly in chronic pancreatitis to particularly tell the mechanism of pain is of multifactorial in which ductal hypertension neurological changes local complications or some other causes the ductal hypertension is usually due to a duct stenosis uh, intraductal calculi or uh, pancreatic tissue hypertension the other neurological changes are neuroplasty neuropathy peripheral sensitization of the nerves some cns changes also 
or it can be due to a local complication like a pseudocyst and inflammatory mass or due to some other due to the increased cholecystic uh, cholecystokinin production due to the positive feedback that the uh, enzymes are not reaching into the duodenum so that's why or due to irritable bowel syndrome bacterial overgrowth or any surgery or endoscopy complication add venous thrombosis to this yes sir yes sir venous thrombosis is another important so the literature describes two types of pain in uh, chronic pancreatitis. Uh, this was in gastroenterology uh, journal. So type A is where there will be pain-free intervals for several months. This may be the case in our patients where type A pain, the onset is uh, severe and then there may be pain-free intervals in between. Whereas in type B, the onset is, uh, after the onset, there will be a chronic background pain will be there. And in between, there will be exacerbations. So uh, type B pain is commonly seen in alcoholic chronic pancreatitis so where there is a complication like a pseudocyst or a pancreatic duct stricture that uh, more points towards type B. And type A is commonly seen in hereditary chronic pancreatitis, so late onset idiopathic chronic pancreatitis. So for steatoria, as we discussed, uh, other than chronic pancreatitis, so pancreatic insufficiency, other causes be due to the bile salt related where the missile formation is not possible and the fat is not digested or due to the impaired intestinal surface epithelium and uh, other causes. Call, so, it, call it diarrhea. Don't call it steatoria. Diarrhea yeah. in pre-nutrition chronic pancreatitis. Yes. So pancreatic insufficiency can be related to chronic pancreatitis, cystic fibrosis or pancreatic malignancy. The bile salt related can be due to bacterial overgrowth, Crohn's disease, primary biliary cirrhosis, PSC or due to a ileal uh, resection. Impaired intestinal surface epithelium causes can be due to celiac disease, AIDS enteropathy or uh, parasitic infections like GRDSs. Other causes include Whipple's disease, some drug-induced, or due to zollinger ellison syndrome. These are the rare causes. So uh, we can now proceed, sir, to the general examination. Um, we have, uh, I think, uh, we will just finish in two minutes. Yes. Is there anything significant there? Uh, sir, uh, uh, BMI was on lower side, sir. Patient was uh, on midarm circumference, triceps. Uh, really lower side? Is that uh, lower side or is he malnourished? Malnourished, sir. Mildly malnourished. Why are you saying mild, mildly malnourished? Is uh, it mild, sir, moderate, again, severe? Yes, sir. Uh, less than 16 is severe, sir. Uh, moderate is uh, from uh, 17 to 16. And uh, from 17 to 18, 18.5 is mild. Okay. Uh, rest examination is fine. Uh, like uh, Rest examination part is normal, sir. Pulse, uh, blood pressure, uh, and respiratory. What is and triceps, fold, thickness? How do you do sir, it? What does it tell tricep you? skin fold thickness, sir. We get a caliper. Uh, with that, uh, we'll measure the thickness in uh, uh, tricep skin fold, sir. It, it will tell regarding the wasting, uh, uh, wasting of the muscle syndrome. In, in, really? In does males, it, it is 12.5 uh, mm. Does it so tell you of the muscles? No, sir. Uh, subcutaneous thickness tells you what? Subcutaneous, uh, subcutaneous fats. Yeah, it is a thing of adipose tissue. Yes, adipose. Right. And what is midarm circumference? How do you use that? Uh, midarm circumference from acromion process to uh, olecranon process from midpoint. Uh, we need to measure with the measuring tape, sir. And then what uh, do you do with it? Uh, sir. How do you that, interpret midarm circumference? Midarm circumference, sir. Uh, no. See? You're right about triceps fold thickness. It tells you an index of what is the adiposity, how much of fat, except in very old patients. But yes. when you look at mid-arm circumference, you have to okay. use that to calculate the muscle. Yes, sir. Right? So yes, sir. That, that is a calculation. You say mid-arm circumference minus, there's a kind of formula that will, yes, tell, you, that will tell you what is a protein kind protein. of uh, thing. Sarcopenia as an indirect evidence. Of course, you have better markers for sarcopenia than this, but these are time-tested uh, things that have been going off thing. So you must be very clear what these mean. Okay? Yes. Uh, sir, in uh, general, head to toe examination, uh, hair was normal. I uh, There was no signs of white out spots. Uh, neck, uh, JVP was not traced. IV can was placed in the right hand. Uh, there was surgical mark, uh, mark uh, scar mark was present in the left, right, lateral aspect of the right hip. Uh, there were no any cutaneous manifestation of internal malignancy, no stigma of uh, tuberculosis, or no signs of any nutritional. What is stigma of TB? I didn't understand. 
uh, sir, I, I mean to say, uh, uh, flexural conjunctivity, uh, flexural conjunctivity or erythema nodosum, some external manifestations of uh, tuberculosis. Any? I don't erythema. think you should use that because they're very non-specific. Either flexural or erythema nodosum are not so specific. So say what there's no flexural or you want to think. Flexural is something that you see usually in children. So it's not don't see it much in adults. Tropholoderma and Trophola are the other parameters. Erythema nodosum. Uh, uh, Actually, um, what I meant was external manifestations of uh, tuberculosis. I don't think you refer to that. Re refer to specific things. Yes, sir. It's not like uh, chronic liver disease. You have various other manifestations. TB is not like that. No, sir. Don't use these general terms. I think they're not very correct. Okay, sir. In systemic examination, sir, oral cavity nicotine stain was uh, present. Uh, in uh, inspection, abdomen was flat, uh, umbilicus inverted, and uh, normal. And all reasons were uh, uh, There was no any significant. Naresh, should we move on? So we I must give this, Ikram enough time. Yeah, absolutely. 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 This can be. Uh, sir, uh, in percussion, so this was percussion essentially normal. normal. Yes, sir, essentially normal, sir. Yes. So is the diagnosis different after examination or the same? Uh, sir, uh, 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 no, sir, it's the uh, same only, sir. Uh, was he present? Syndromic diagnosis is chronic recurrent visceral pain, most likely pancreatic type, which was associated with exocrine and endocrine insufficiency with uh, unquantified weight loss. Sir. So why don't you straight away say with malnutrition? Oh, yes, sir. Malnutrition. That'll... Yes. Okay. 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 Um, this is important, I think, uh, Mahesh, that once you have given a BMI and you've given the mid-arm circumference, you've given uh, thickness of the triceps, skin, then you don't call it unquantified. You have already quantified enough yes. of what is the yes. nutritional status. What is the nutritional status? All right. So, Gajanan, let's move on. Yes, sir. So, uh, before we move on to the investigations, we have the third poll question. So, uh, what is the median time? Can we start the uh, polls, Mr. Manish? Yeah. So, what is the median time for development of exocrine insufficiency in alcohol-related chronic pancreatitis? 0 to 5, 10 to 15, uh, 25 to 30 years or 35 to 40 years? So the uh, opinion poll goes in favor of 10 to 15 years. Yes, sir. So uh, it's quite correct. Uh, the answer is that uh, in alcoholic chronic pancreatitis, just a second, I'll close with this. In alcoholic chronic pancreatitis, the median time is 13.1 years, whereas in early onset, it is 16.9 years, and in late onset, 26. This is from a large natural history study, which is also quoted in Schlesinger. So it might be important for the PGs to remember. So then coming to the investigation, sir. I think uh, we will involve Vikram now. Yes, yes sir. sir. Um, so Vikram, what investigations do you want? Uh, sir, in this case, uh, because the clinical... Uh, Symptoms and signs are uh, more suggestive of chronic pancreatitis with uh, endocrine, exocrine insufficiency and with malnutrition. I'd like to first uh, investigate for uh, the etiology, uh, the first uh, diagnosis and then etiology and then for the complication. For the uh, diagnosis, I'll, uh, there are, uh, I'll do the uh, complete uh, uh, blood count, liver function test and uh, the imaging in the first investigation of studies that will be uh, so CT uh, contrast and a CT scan of the uh, abdomen with the uh, uh, pancreatic protocol, uh, which will give the uh, di diagnosis of uh, chronic pancreatitis, uh, or if we, uh, MRI with MR uh, uh, CP. Uh, for the uh, etiological, what workup, is the advantage of uh, MR over CT, or is there a disadvantage, and how do you reconcile? So the advantage of uh, MR. Over uh, CT scan is uh, with the help of MRI, we will be uh, first uh, will be able to uh, look the uh, ductal system. Um, we are able, we will be able to uh, see the uh, stones, and uh, if there is a complication like pseudocyst, we'll be able to uh, look at the content of the uh, pseudocyst, whether it's necrotic or not. And uh, our CT scan, the advantage is uh, it, it uh, MRI. That another advantage there is a decrease ionization. Uh, uh, exposure and uh, contrast. Uh, for CT scan, the advantage is uh, it is uh, mainly uh, we will be able to look at the wall uh, of the pseudocyst if it is present. And uh, uh, but what we uh, the uh, sensitive yeah, specific... just have a patient. 
all that you know is you've got a patient chronic pancreatitis, mm. right? You, you think you have chronic pancreatitis. So there, what would be your first choice? Would it be a CT or an MR? When you give answers, let them always be very short and precise. Uh, for I will like to go do uh, MRI with MRCP as a first. I'm not very sure. I think my first choice would be a CT. I don't know, maybe Mahesh uh, and uh, Samir. Yeah, I think in, uh, uh, before we discuss ultra, uh, CT and MRI, will ultrasound will be uh, somewhere in the algorithm or you think ultrasound is useless in this case? No, sir. Uh, ultrasound is, uh, will be uh, useful in this uh, in the patient with chronic pain uh, in the for the diagnosis in this case. The for the uh, uh, the only issue with the ultrasound is the presence of the bobble gas, which may obscure the pancreas. Uh, which um, and the sensitivity of uh, ultrasound to pick up the chronic pancreatitis is around 54%. Uh, the accuracy is 54%. Uh, with uh, uh, and uh, ultrasound is still in, uh, it will be the first uh, investigation choice. Apart from that, we'll be able to look at the gallbladder and uh, biliary system in a patient with uh, chronic pancreatitis. So ultrasound is still in the picture. I think there can be uh, multiple opinions in this, and I, we do not have one single answer. But I still will do an ultrasound in this case. My cause of concern is that this patient has very atypical presentation for nine years. And maybe that we have a combination of two diseases and there may be cholelithiasis along with chronic pancreatitis now. And if you get into the doing a CT scan, you may miss a cholelithiasis altogether. So I would still possibly do an ultrasound before I proceed to either CT or MRI. And I think uh, between the CT and MRI, it can be anybody's choice. But in practice, we always do a CT scan before we do any other investigation. So, there are, there are one point, two points I want to make. See, one of the investigation which have been very useful, we, we regularly get it done is X-ray abdomen. See, X-ray abdomen, a very useful investigation, especially if the stones are radio opaque. They give an idea what kind of stone you are dealing with. So one more point I want to make is, if stones are small, then non-contrast CT is better than pancreatic protocol CT. Because when you use a pancreatic protocol with contrast, you may miss small stones. So it's a case-to-case -case basis. Okay, if there are large stones seen, you can you can do CT or MRI with MRCP. But if you are suspecting small stones, what you can do is you can get an X-ray abdomen and a contrast CT because small stones introductor will not be missed on non-contrast CT. All right, so uh, let's go through the investigations. Uh, this patient was uh, evaluated in 2019, where blood investigations were uh, uh, the, Go back uh, previous normal. slide. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, the uh, complete hemogram, uh, renal function, and liver functions were normal, and blood sugar level were elevated. Fasting was 180 and postprandial 235. So both were elevated. Uh, the MRCP we have of 2019, uh, which uh, the, uh, the the 3D construction and image and the axial section, uh, which shows there is a pancreas, uh, the dilated irregular pancreatic duct with uh, multiple uh, peeling defects. And uh, there are also, uh, we can see there are side branches which are, uh, which are visible. Apart from, the, uh, apart from that, uh, we see there is a, the gallbladder was uh, distended and there was no any uh, peeling defect in it. This was more suggest uh, this was suggestive of chronic uh, uh, calcific pancreatitis. And uh, uh, with, uh, so is it mild, moderate or severe? Uh, and what classification do you use for severity of chronic pancreatitis? Uh, sir, on ERCP, we use Cambridge classification. So can you quickly tell us what is mild, what is moderate, what is severe? Yes, sir, on uh, Cambridge, uh, it is divided into main pancreatic duct and the side branches. So if it is uh, it is normal, if the main pancreatic duct uh, filling of the side branch is normal and the side branches are not uh, uh, visible, it is equivocal if it is no main pancreatic duct filling and uh, less than three uh, side branches which are uh, visible, uh, if it is, it is normal, uh, it is mild if it is uh, no uh, main pancreatic duct filling and more than or equal to three uh, side branches. Moderate if it's abnormal filling of main pancreatic duct and more than three uh, or equal to three side branches. And uh, it is uh, severe if presence of any one of the following that is filling defect or presence of obstructive lesion or uh, if there is a cyst which is more than 10 mm and, uh, uh, and if there is a... Uh, yeah, and with, along with that, there is more equal to three side branches which are present. So that uh, is a severe uh, in Cambridge classification, ERCP diagnosis. Okay. Um, this patient, yes. Carry on, carry on. Uh, you were showing some other, the MRCP is finished. Now this is yeah. ERCP or showing. ERCP. Uh, and then I think there are some yeah. interesting questions that came up on the- Yeah, I know, it's tool examination. 
on stool examinations, sudan stains, teatocrit, uh, fecal elastis. Uh, what are your comments on that, uh, Vikram? Uh, so uh, for the pan uh, for pancreatic uh, uh, function, we uh, do direct and indirect that uh, two sets of uh, uh, tests. Uh, no, no, no the, theory. Uh, but is it required in this is particular required, patient? Not required. In this case, as such, uh, we don't require, sir, because uh, no, uh, the history suggests of teatoria now. So as such, we don't require this. Uh, I agree test. with you. Here you have a patient with chronic pancreatitis, unequivocal. Two is that we don't have to prove steatoria. You go by, is he having weight loss? Is he malnourished? Is he having some, in which case you have to, you know, you correct his diabetes, which may be one factor. You also look at, they can give him, you are going to give him pancreatic enzyme replacement. So there's no need to waste your uh, time, energy and resources in doing these tests because irrespective of what you get there, you're going to put him on point. Gajanan? That's my take, I don't know, Samir. Yeah, this, is, uh, this yeah. is Vikram. Uh, yes, Vikram, sir. Gajanan is facilitator. It's Vikram yeah. who is a student. I'm, sorry, sir. I'm so sorry. Vikram, I just yes. want to ask, go to ERCP. Basis, on the basis of whatever imaging you have, what is the possibility that he's a, he'll be a good responder to endotherapy or he'll be an average responder or a poor responder? See, before giving the option of therapy versus surgery, this decision has to be made in a multidisciplinary manner that what are the chances that this patient will respond to whatever endotherapy we are providing? So can you tell us based on imaging that he is likely to respond or he is unlikely to respond to whatever endotherapy we are going to do? Sir, on the basis of the uh, imaging, uh, he is uh, the candidate who will respond to the endotherapy uh, because of the dilated uh, main pancreatic duct and the uh, presence of uh, filling defects. So endotherapy helps in this case. Uh, if it is a... So, uh, if I ask you the question in reverse way, which are the patient which will not be good candidate for endotherapy? Uh, the patient uh, who have a minimal ductal disease are the candidates who, uh, who may not respond. Uh, who are there any other patients? Any other patients? So if there is a patient with multiple strictures, uh, uh, that, that is... will not respond. Somebody who has an inflammatory mass will not be a good responder to endotherapy. So these are some of the other conditions which you should think of. Samir, anything you want to add? I'm, what I want to see, because his disease is limited to the head region, I agree with Vikram that we should give an endotherapy trial. Though there are problems like prolonged history, recurrent episodes of pain, which are bad prognostic indicators, but the morphology of the duct and the location of the disease is very important. So if the disease is located only in the head region, I think we should give a trial of endotherapy. I agree with him. Absolutely. Okay, carry on. ERCP was done in 2019 and there they have done the when you counsel this patient, what are you going to tell him is the likelihood that he's going to have some response in his pain? Uh, with the help of endotherapy, I will uh, explain the patient that uh, the the, uh, the initial response or the short-term response will be uh, good in this candidate. It may be around 60 to 70%, but there is a chances of recurrence of pain. Good. So this was the year 2019, where the papillary stenosis was seen on the uh, ampulla, uh, a side endoscopy, and uh, uh, the splintotomy was done. So, so uh, we, this was this procedure was done uh, not in Apollo, isn't it? It was done elsewhere, sir. Till now, all the investigations were done elsewhere. Okay, and uh, they have mentioned that its sphincterotomy was done, but the deep cannulation was not possible. Not I, possible because of narrow. So, Vikram, do you think yes. it was an adequate therapy, or you felt that? This was inadequate and patient should have been referred elsewhere, considering the profile of the patient. Because they had done only sphincterotomy. Okay. So do you think it's good enough or they needed to do more? I mean, there must have been technical problem, I can understand. But uh, first of all, sir, uh, this patient had a, uh, uh, there was narrowing in the uh, head region. So just sphincterotomy uh, may not help. We need to uh, decompress the uh, narrowing either by uh, doing a uh, deep conversion or uh, putting the stent and uh, possibly putting the stent. What else? What is the standard operating procedure when you have a patient with a duct like this, you've gone in, you can't get in, you've done a pancreatic stentotomy, then what else do you do? We may do a, a endoscopic shockwave with a trip scene. No. First, but what we need to do is, if you're going to leave anatomy like this, what would do a balloon dilatation? Right? If there is, there may be a stenosis, a short segment stenosis, balloon dilatation. 
No, but I think uh, I think uh, Naresh here they could not enter the pentagram. Yeah, yeah. It looks like they could not enter the pentagram. Yeah. So what Vikram it, it basically suggested that if endotherapy is attempted, it has to be appropriate endotherapy. Yes. Okay, it has to be dilatation, removal of stones, and stenting, depending yes. what the profile of the duct is. Okay. Yes. So, and uh, one, uh, one more question is that uh, there was a question asked by Hema. As to what sphincterotomy was this? Was it a biliary sphincterotomy or a pancreatic sphincterotomy? It's a It looks a little surprising to me that uh, a pancreatic sphincterotomy was done, but the guide wire could not be passed. So uh, you can never be sure that you are cutting the pancreatic sphincter. No, I think what they did was I think they got a guide wire, but couldn't get uh, deeper. And that's why they went and did a sphincterotomy. I don't know. All right. Okay. Let's, let's leave it at that. Uh, so the, when the patient visited this time on uh, 6th of November, uh, the uh, blood investigation for a complete hemogram was, uh, there was leukopenia, borderline, renal function, liver functions were within normal limit, and blood sugar level was elevated. How do you interpret the hemogram? So in this case, uh, uh, to interpret, uh, he had a, a neutropenia. Uh, however, uh, however, this can be because of the uh, poor nutrition, or maybe a nutritional deficiency, uh, but Along with neutral uh, leukopenia, I would have been, uh, there should have been uh, pancytopenia to look contributed for B12 deficiency. Why uh, but, there be pancytopenia? Sir? There need not be always be pancytopenia. Okay. Even one. Can How many be. patients do you see just with anemia, just with uh, low platelets? And there is a B12 deficiency. So you would correct it, look for it, whatever it is, appropriately yes. react to it. Yes. So, uh, and uh, uh, the further workup we did, calcium was normal. Lipid profile was uh, uh, was within uh, normal limit, except HDL being low. HB1C was 9.5%. Uh, uh, serological markers were negative. IgG were neg uh, negative. Amelia lipase is normal, and CA99 was normal. TSH was also 1.68, was normal limit. And vitamin, total vitamin D was uh, low. It was 18. What is this album? Oh, Normal 4.4. Which, which is surprising, but variation can always be there. So there's low TLC, low vitamin D, plus the clinical parameters of malnutrition. Which kind of... uh, was parathormone done in this patient? Uh, parathormone, uh, we have not done sir, parathormone in this case. But calcium was normal. Calcium was normal, so we did not. All right. Do okay, all right. Now, if you had the same calcium with a very low albumin, you know, you would have sort of then uh, I would have corrected the calcium with uh, yeah. albumin and if it is elevated. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, carry on. So yeah. We have a fourth sure. poll question here for the audience. Um, so can we have the polls here, Mr. Manish? So the four choices. Yes, sir. The poll has not started it. Mr. Manish, can we start the poll? Manish, please run the poll. I think uh, let's let's move on. Um, let's uh, move I'll just on. launching. Launch. Okay, okay. So it started. Which of the following is not true for type one autoimmune pancreatitis? Uh, obstructive jaundice is the most common presentation. Second, males are more commonly involved than female. Third, relapses are rare in type one autoimmune pancreatitis. And fourth, this focal as well as diffuse pancreatic enlargement may be seen on imaging. Yes, the poll has ended. So uh, most of them think that uh, relapses are rare in type 1 autoimmune, that is 64. However, 17% says that obstructive jaundice is the most common presentation. That question was, which is not true. So the obstructive jaundice is the most common presentation for type 1 autoimmune pancreatitis. However, regarding relapses, there are frequent relapses around 50% of the times in type 1 autoimmune pancreatitis. However, they are rare or there are no relapses in type 2. So option C is the correct answer. Carry on. Uh, so the fecal elastase was done. Uh, this was found to be low. This is less than 200. Vikram, 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 just one point. Yes. That fecal elastase sample is not given on a loose stool. It can be falsely positive. Yes, sir. a patient uh, was passing it, normal stool right now, sir. It has to be on a formed stool. If it is diluted, if yes. it is anemia, then you can have false falsely. Falsely, yeah. it will be false. Yeah, carry on. Carry on. There's some question in the audience that asks, whether PERT would um, modify the interpretation of the fecal elastase. Vikram, would you want to answer that? Uh, sir, it has been uh, seen that the PERT uh, is uh, 
uh, there, whenever there is a low fecal elastase, the pert helps. No, no, no. If you, no, no. Can you do fecal elastase on a patient who is on enzyme replacement therapy? Uh, sir, uh, as such, there is no recommendation, but uh, if uh, the fecal elastase is low and uh, even patient on PERT, that means there is, we need to look for other things like whether the dose is inadequate or whether the patient has uh, uh, taken PPI along with it or not, and any other disease like SIBO or any other things, which is contributing to the still uh, ineffective uh, dose of PERT or uh, still steatoria. It doesn't, the... affect, it doesn't affect the thing. But how would you now, suppose you have a patient on PERT, how would you assess doing fecal elastase, fecal fat, uh, what is this uh, fat absorption coefficient? How will you monitor these patients? Uh, so in most of the studies which have done, uh, they have calculated the coefficient of fat, ex uh, fat excretion. And uh, they have uh, seen... Uh, uh, Simple on... answer is you monitor them clinically. Clinically, we have monitor to monitor them with their symptoms. You monitor them with their weight. Yes. That's a simple answer. Okay. Just go ahead. You see, elastase is not a good monitoring tool because the test tests only the endogenous elastase. So whatever... Yeah, it will not get affected by PERT. It's not affected. That's very important. One more point that we did fecal elastase always better to document, but in this case, there was Frank's tutorial. So even if it didn't have fecal elastase, we could have treated this patient, but that you documented it. Yes. Uh, I think we're left uh, with only seven minutes, so let's move on. This patient came as, uh, and uh, the MRCP was done on uh, at admission, and uh, we found there is a chronic calcific pancreatitis with MP, uh, main pancreatic diameter of 0.8 centimeter, multiple calculus in main pancreatic duct, and prominent side branches. Uh, so coming to the management, uh, the management of this patient, uh, first is uh, we will, uh, uh, the IV fluid, we gave the IV fluid and analysis with, as patient had pain and PPI. Uh, then uh, the nutritional management, uh, one uh, patient according to the uh, BMI uh, and the uh, stress factor, uh, the BMI, was the calculated calories and protein was started. Pandicating enzyme uh, was started for him, uh, which was enteric coated uh, uh, tablet, which was with a 40,000 USP with meals. And uh, later, uh, then uh, diabetic management with the short acting insulin and vitamin uh, and calcium supplement was started. And he was told to have a uh, abstinence of alcohol and continue abstinence of alcohol and stop smoking. Uh, the, on, on day four, this chap becomes a little drowsy and starts having swelling of his feet. It can be because of uh, the patient uh, hyperalimentation. Uh, when we uh, what uh, is the term to, used? Uh, it is uh, uh, refeeding. What is refeeding it? syndrome? Refeeding syndrome. The patient oh. may have refeeding syndrome. So how would you have prevented it? Uh, we start the patient with the uh, low, uh, um, le like we start slow, gradually, sir. We will start at a 50% of the what is required and then gradually increase it. So it's more like one third. You start off with one third of his requirement and every few days you increase the thing. Don't keep him on a very high carb. Make sure that you give him his thiamine. Make sure you monitor his electrolytes and magnesium. Yes. So these are preventable. So never start off with nutritional management at full dose. Yes. This patient is significantly malnourished. All right. Very yes. So the ERCP was done, and uh, we, the first uh, image shows the pancreatogram where there's, there is a, a narrowing at the uh, head region, and the second shows there is a uh, dilated main pancreatic duct, which is irregular, and the side branches are visible. And uh, with the multiple feeling, uh, multiple uh, radio opaque uh, opacities, um, which is a suggestion of calculus. And uh, the third, uh, we have put a pancreatic stent uh, in it, which is a single pigtail stent. Uh, here we identified the ampulla, and uh, uh, the pancreatogram showed irregular dilated MPT with multiple feeling defects and prominent side branches and narrowing the head of pancreas. After splinterotomy and uh, the, the dilatation, uh, titan balloon dilatation, repeated balloons are done and uh, white colored stones and sludge came out and seven French nine centimeters single picture stent was placed. So according to Cambridge, it was severe uh, chronic acidic pancreatitis uh, with MPD stricture and pancreatic plast uh, plastic stent was uh, uh, done. So are you uh, happy putting a seven French stent or you think a 10 French stent would have been better? Uh, sir, uh, ideally, uh, according to EG guideline, uh, 10 French is what we recommended, but uh, because this patient had a uh, uh, the stricture, uh, I think seven French is correct. You have not told us the size of the MPD. You can't the put a without telling us what is the size. 
the size will decide the thing of the stent. I think he mentioned that there is I eight millimeters. Point eight, point eight uh, I mentioned in MSP it was eight centimeter, point eight. Point eight centimeter. Okay. Uh, and uh, extra abdomen was done uh, of, of, after four days to uh, see for the um, ductal clearance, and we uh, we see there is a uh, the arrow shows there is a few opacities in the uh, in the pancreatic duct, and the pancreatic duct stent is uh, still in place. And then uh, the follow-up advice, we ask the patient to uh, review uh, on follow-up if the patient, uh, the plan is if the patient continues to have uh, pain uh, with this, then we will uh, try uh, ESWL and uh, ERCP plus uh, PR, uh, PD clearance and assessment after three to six months, uh, proper glycemic control and nutrition care. So what is this glycemic control? How are you going to achieve it? So uh, first of all, uh, glycemic control, uh, because this patient is insulin dependent, uh, we will uh, uh, monitor, first of all, I will uh, look, uh, start him on long acting insulins. And along with that, uh, the oral hypoglycemic agent, if it, uh, if it, is, it works like metformin, I would like to start uh, because, uh, uh, because it has a less chance of hypoglycemia. And this patient with chronic pancreatitis. Uh, metformin, yes or no? Sir? Is yes. metformin, yes or no? I will start metformin. Why? Metformin, so another. We die with insulin alone. So, why do you want to give metformin, it? Uh, it has been seen by a few studies that metformin also decreases secondary pancreatic cancer rate. So, okay. this may also. So, all patients with chronic pancreatitis should receive some amount of metformin. It can be a small dose or larger dose depending on his needs, but some metformin is essential. Very good. Vikram, when this patient comes to you, how often will you do look for glycemic control? And what will you look at when the patient comes to you on follow-up after three to six months? Uh, glycemic control. Uh, will uh, first I will ask the patient to have a blood uh, sugar chart at home, and uh, so that we will have a look over it. And the second is uh, we need to do, as sir said previously, uh, the uh, fasting and postprandial blood sugar is more important rather than HbA1c. And uh, uh, after three to six months, uh, I will uh, ask the patient. I will uh, assess the patient for uh, abdominal pain and uh, presence of. Uh, other symptoms like uh, the, his weight loss, whether he has regained or not, and presence of steatorrhea or any new onset of abdominal pain or any other complaints. According to that, been... yeah. yeah. Six months later, his sugars again are not controlled, go way up. What are you going to do? Uh, I look for, uh, I, I will look whether the patient, uh, I'll do the imaging and look whether the patient has a developed a malignancy or uh, in which case it may be there. Second, uh, first is, sorry, the non-compliance, which is more common. And second, I would like to look for the malignancy. Great. Uh, sir, can we go to the last Yeah. Point? We'll yeah. wind up in another two minutes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So can you start the poll question, Mr. Manish? So which of the following is not a predictor for best response to endoscopic therapy in painful chronic pancreatitis? Location of stones in head of pancreas, absence of an MPD stricture, higher frequency of pain at attacks, or short disease duration? Okay, so it's 22 seconds, you can end it. Okay. So uh, there are 34%, 38% uh, who says that it should be the short disease duration, whereas 34% says it should be the higher frequency of pain attacks. Uh, so this is given in the UEG guidelines 2017, that who of these patients will respond best to endoscopic therapy. So if the location of the stones is in the head of pancreas, yes. If there is an absence of MPD stricture, yes. However, the frequency of pain attacks should be low. So the answer here is C, higher frequency of pain attacks, and short disease duration will favor to a endoscopic therapy response. So I just have final three, four slides uh, regarding the complications of chronic pancreatitis. As we discussed, pain is the most uh, common, 80 to 90%, whereas osteoporosis, diabetes, weight loss, and pseudocysts are the other ones following it. Similarly, pancreatic cancer, malabsorption are the following ones. And there can also be uh, pancreatic ascites, pseudoaneurysm, splenicoportal vein thrombosis, and vitamin D deficiencies. So how do we approach our pain? First, if uh, we see whether the pain is related to the pancreatic risk, for that we, uh, according to the history, accordingly, then we see whether there is any ductal obstruction, any uh, post-duct clearance or any small duct disease. Before that, we can start on NSAIDs or low potency opiates. After uh, evaluating what is the cause, in all of these, we start with antioxidants. Now, there is a 
difference of there might be a difference of opinion here as one study shows that antioxidant helps to relieve pain one shows that uh, it does not uh, for ductal obstruction we have to do a endotherapy or surgery where we decompress the duct and after that we evaluate these patients whether the response is adequate or if there is any recurrence of pain if there is a recurrence of pain we have to again evaluate whether it is due to another stone a local complication or a malignancy if it is just due to an inadequate re response we can step up the pain therapy to pregabalin and then after that if there is inadequate response we can consider other combination like ssris or celiac uh, plexus block or celiac uh, neurolysis i think so, celiac neurolysis role is extremely limited most yes, also in selected that. patients yes sir useless so, oh, sorry sir sorry uh, so for the pancreatic duct calculi just two slides more uh, for the pancreatic duct calculi if they are symptomatic and they are small better we can do a ercp and extract it with the balloon or basket however if they are large and located in the head with no stricture and eswl or er a plus minus ercp can help in case selected cases we might have to do a pancreaticoscopy and lithotripsy and even if it fails then we consider surgery however if there are already extensive calculi multiple strictures a suspicious head mass in these cases we might directly favor a surgery similarly uh, whether the role of eswl in which patient so after imaging if there is a large pancreatic ductal calculi which is radio opaque then we prefer eswl where we uh, try to fragment the stones to less than 3 mm and after that we do a pancreatic sphincterotomy with uh, pancreatic duct clearance however if they are radio lucent we can uh, try an endoscopic uh, pancreatic sphincterotomy plus a naso pancreatic tube and after that eswl and later clearance so uh, the take, uh, take home message for today's presentation was that a detailed history of pain abdomen helps to reach the diagnosis and as we discussed it is multifactorial in chronic pancreatitis the exocrine insufficiency usually develops earlier than endocrine insufficiency and uh, idiopathic chronic pancreatitis is the most common cause of chronic pancreatitis in india persistent pain abdomen osteoporosis diabetes mellitus and weight loss are some of the most common complications eswl should be considered in large radio opaque pancreatic duct calculi where the uh, stones are located in the head of the pancreas without any downstream stricture thank you i think we can uh, yes sir please continue the slides yes. there was a last question from dr kamlesh that is the clearance required after eswl again there is controversy but most centers would do a clearance immediately after eswl in the same city okay uh naresh so I, uh, samir any final comments yeah yes, yes i want to say one thing on the last slide failed endotherapy we define generally when 3 to 5 attempts of endotherapy fails so we have to realize that when we need to stop with endotherapy and ask the surgeons to have a look maximum of five attempts with endotherapy it works fine otherwise patient goes to surgery yeah but the other thing sabir is also true that the longer we wait the surgical report results also become poor absolutely so I, yeah i agree so we need to be uh, kind of choosy what we when we going to do endotherapy when we going to give them surgery and be always a little uh, kind of uh, think about what you promise the patient because the results may never seem to be as good as we think in spite of a very favorable anatomy yeah absolutely All right okay uh, so so we 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 like to end our session today so uh, first of all i'd like to thank uh, uh, mahesh sir for uh, for coordinating the session and ensuring that the students make a wonderful presentation and both the students i would like to congratulate for presenting the case well and also discussing it well uh, i'd also like to thank uh, gajanan for facilitating the event well and uh, uh, lastly naresh sir and samir sir for sparing their valuable time on a sunday and discussing the case with us so thank you we again enjoyed, yeah, we enjoyed the presentation it was very enlightening and kind of you know good case presentation and good discussion i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. and well spent yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you sir thank you uh, so on behalf to go samir <laughs> So and it's in Calcutta today, Narish. Ah, ah, right. I remember the time we went for the IPL in Calcutta during one of your meetings. Right? Yes, it was one of the endocons. Yeah, yeah. Ran away from your dinner and went there. I know. <laughs> uh, so again, on behalf of the Indian Society of Gastroenterology, I'd like to thank uh, uh, all the students for again uh, joining the session, and we'll meet you next week for the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks, Vidar. Thanks, Mahesh. Bye -bye. Thank you, Narish. Thank you, Samir. No,